Okay, so hi everyone. Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. And thank you for joining us today. I'm Lei Xu, an incoming postdoc at the Center for Tobacco Research at the Ohio State University. And TOPS is organized by Mike Pasco at University of Missouri, Te Shang at the Ohio State University, and Michael Durden at Johns Hopkins University and Jamie Hartman Boyce at University of Massachusetts Amherst. So this seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. And the audience may post questions and comments in the Q&A panel. And the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. And please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. And please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. And questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. And so your questions are very much appreciated. And this presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. And I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Te Shang, from the Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Um, today, we continue our summer 2024 season with a workshop presentation by Doug Levy entitled Policy Implementation Science, Moving Beyond Binary Definition of Tobacco Policy. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submission through the TOPS website. Dr. Doug Levy is an associate professor of medicine at Howard Medical School. He is also a core faculty member at the Morgan Institute of Massachusetts General Hospital, where he is a member of the Health Policy Research Center and serves as the director of policy research for the Tobacco Research and Treatment Center. Dr. Levy's training is in health policy and health services research and his research focuses on improving prevention and population health with a focus on tobacco policy and epidemiology, as well as behavioral economics approach to promoting health food choice. His tobacco policy research is wide ranging with recent topics that include smoke-free housing, the cost and cost effectiveness of implementing novel smoking cessation programs, and the implementation and impact of policies restricting the sales and use of electronic cigarettes. Dr. Gina Cruz, an associate professor of medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and Jeannie Chadwick, a doctoral candidate at Brandeis University's, uh, University, are co-authors of the study and will answer selected questions in the Q&A. Dr. Levy, thank you for presenting for us today. Great. Um, thank you uh, so much for having me. I'm really excited to share this work with uh, this audience in particular. Um, just as a, a heads up, this is qualitative research, um, and I know that most of the work presented here is quantitative, but I think the, uh, the spirit of what I'll be presenting today is to sort of have us think about how we approach the quantitative questions that we're interested in in, in policy evaluation um, and, uh, you know, as, as the title implies, moving sort of beyond binary, binary definitions of tobacco policy and thinking a bit about sort of what some of the variations in tobacco policy implementation are. Um, and the work will sort of be uh, uh, focused largely on uh, e-cigarette policy. Um, so these are my disclosures. Uh, this work is being funded by NIDA, um, but I've uh, had no, uh, no uh, tobacco related funding sources for the past 10 years or longer. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to start off the presentation with a, a quote from one of the participants um, in uh, our, our qualitative interviews. So um, this is uh, somebody who's in uh, the tobacco control office of uh, a state health agency. I mean, I think an unintended consequence on some level is that people thought something was being done in this space and it wasn't. And that's never good. If the public, if the industry, if legislators or other regulators think something is being taken care of because there's a law or a policy in place on that, they choose not to take action. And when something's not implemented, that's an unintended consequence of that policy. So um, this work is part of what we're calling the Vaping Policy Research Study or VAPOR, very cleverly named there. Um, and as the, 
one of the aims of this project, we're investigating the implementation of policies that restrict the sales and use of e-cigarettes. Um, we're doing work uh, across uh, 50 states, um, but we're also within Massachusetts, uh, where we uh, uh, are our home base. Um, we're also doing some uh, work in, at the town and school level. Um, but today I'm going to be focusing uh, principally on the state level um, research that we've been doing. So um, what does it mean to take a policy implementation science approach uh, to tobacco policy? Um, our starting point for this work was a, a, an article that was published by Heather Bullock and colleagues a few years ago in the journal Implementation Science. And um, what they did was uh, developed a framework for um, uh, policy implementation science. And to do that, um, they kind of combed over the literature of knowledge translation, public policy, and implementation science, gathering as many articles as they could that were relevant to understand sort of every possible in and out of how the steps from when a policy is conceived to the sort of um, most distal uh, effects of those policies. Um, and uh, so there was quantitative work uh, and qualitative uh, studies that they pulled into this. And from that, they um, put together a fairly comprehensive and detailed and granular framework for understanding how policies uh, get implemented. Um, so there's a couple of uh, main pieces to this that I think are worth um, describing in a little uh, bit more detail. So um, one of the first things that they laid out in the paper is a, a process model. Um, and so you can see here that there are strata, there's policy level A here and policy level B, um, just as examples. You could think of policy level B for in our situation as being um, state level tobacco policy, policy level A could be federal tobacco policy, which sort of provides a context for the state level policy. Um, and, you know, I mentioned we're doing town and school uh, level research as well, so those could be policy levels C and D, for example. And then with, you know, on each uh, uh, stratum there, there's uh, an, an active implementation zone, and you can sort of think of this as a sequence of events moving from left to right, where we're starting off with sort of a problem definition and agenda setting, just kind of the ideation of policy, followed by developing policies and then actually um, passing policies into law or enacting them through regulation. And that's sort of the starting point for the work that um, we're considering um, for our project. We're, take, we're starting with kind of the laws as put in, into place um, by the government and then uh, examining how those are actually uh, uh, put into force um, through the actions of state health agencies and others. So uh, once there is a policy package, a written document um, that outlines kind of the levers um, through which the policy is supposed to act, then there are implementing organizations. Um, so this could be uh, departments of public health um, or other state agencies that uh, might be involved, um, even local uh, agencies. Those folks are sort of taking the written document and trying to figure out what's the strategy for getting these policies into place. There are also street level bureaucrats. These are the folks who are you know, really on the front lines of sort of uh, putting the policy into action. And there are recipients. And in the case of e-cigarette policy, um, this is typically tobacco retailers, but not exclusively, depending on what the policy is. Um, but it can also be folks who are a little bit further down the line, um, including you know, the end users of e-cigarette products uh, themselves. Um, there are uh, you know, opportunities for evaluation along the way and um, a variety of outcomes that one might be in interested in. Those could be implementation outcomes, such as number of inspections that are conducted or a number of fines that are levied. Um, but it can also be, again, um, these sort of uh, population health uh, outcomes as well and a variety of other things. So that, that's sort of the, the logic of um, how these processes uh, move um, in, in time. Um, and then they also, as part of their policy, framework development, um, we're drilling down and, as I mentioned, sort of getting into very granular detail um, as to what the various um, uh, aspects of policy implementation that may be uh, important in different contexts. And so um, in the upper left here, we have policy instruments and strategies. 
These are uh, things, you know, basically the, the written document uh, in, in many cases, but laying out kind of what the details of the policies are. So uh, there may be legal and regulatory pathways through which policies are put into place. There may be um, economic aspects to it uh, that could include things like the fines that are levied um, or funding for uh, implementing agencies. Um, there could be voluntary aspects where, you know, there are pieces that are sort of expected to um, uh, sort of come through uh, the policy, but that are not necessarily required. Um, and the policy, of course, will lay out sort of who the targets for um, the, the actions are. Then there's, of course, policy actors. So these are the agencies as well as the people within the agencies and people outside of the agencies that um, have some role uh, in, in um, the implementation process. And um, the framework sort of uh, guides us to looking at their relationships with one another, um, the powers that they have, the context that they're um, operating within. And then, of course, there are determinants, the things that are sort of, you know, the where we focus a lot of our energy on barriers and facilitators to um, achieving the outcomes uh, that are, you know, laid out um, and desired by the policy. And that can, you know, take on a variety of dimensions. Um, including things like vertical hierarchy and um, relationships uh, uh, on an individual or interagency basis, other organizations that may be involved, et cetera. Um, timing and sequencing, of course, matter as do things like external uh, environment and policy uh, context. So um, basically what this framework is doing is providing uh, some structure for um, interrogating the implementation process in a way that hopefully um, lets us kind of see from every conceivable angle um, what are the, the factors that are involved in policy implementation. And as we think about, you know, sort of quantitative evaluation of policy implementation, um, you know, we may want to, these, these sorts of insights may be helpful in um, honing those sorts of analyses. So how do we apply this to the vapor study? Um, First of all, you know, there, uh, as folks here will certainly know, a variety of policies that touch on uh, e-cigarette sales and use. Um, some of the top uh, ones that we're all aware of are restrictions on the sales of flavored products, um, minimum legal sales age, so tobacco 21 laws, for example, um, licensure requirements for tobacco product retailers, excise taxes, clean indoor air laws. Um, so those are, you know, kind of a, a, a big five, if you will. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, focused on uh, restrictions on the sales of flavor products just as sort of a means of, um, you know, putting a point on our discussion. But um, the work that we're doing in the vapor study does touch on all five of these. So um, the landscape of uh, state level uh, restrictions on the sales of flavored e-cigarettes uh, is laid out here. Um, these policies are now present in seven states plus the District of Columbia in the United States. Um, the first one, uh, policy in place came in Massachusetts back in 2019. Um, the most recent is in California in 2022. Um, and there is some variability in the details of these policies across the country. So, um, for example, uh, Utah exempts uh, currently mint and menthol products, um, as well as uh, vape shops um, in Massachusetts. You can uh, there's actually not technically a ban on flavored products. You can still buy a wide range of flavored products, but you can only use them in um, uh, vape shops or, or vape lounges, essentially. Um, Maryland also uh, exempts menthol. Um, their restriction only applies to uh, cartridge-based and disposable devices, and their policy is put in place by an executive order rather than through legislation. So you can see there is some variation in the details here, and, and as some folks may be aware, um, California also actually updated their law this year, and Utah has uh, an update to their law, which is going to come into effect at the beginning of 2025. So um, for our work, um, we did key informant interviews. Um, so uh, the, the folks that we were interested in speaking with um, about e policy implementation were uh, identified uh, through um, collaboration with the Tobacco Control Network of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Um, the folks who we were uh, sort of at first pass interested in speaking with were directors of tobacco control uh, for uh, each state. But if the director indicated to us that they were 
not the appropriate interviewee for this topic, um, they could help identify somebody else, um, either within their department or otherwise, um, that would be uh, important for us to speak with. Um, our study staff work to identify uh, alternate and additional interviewees as necessary. Um, and what we did was semi-structured interviews and, and our interview guides were designed to probe all of the aspects of the Bullock model, um, you know, which I laid out in some detail uh, earlier, but there's actually, you know, uh, some, you know, a, a fair bit additional detail on top of that. We uh, conducted our interviews by Zoom. We had one interviewer um, and one note taker for each conversation. Um, our, our interviews were recorded and transcribed. And uh, we used qualitative analysis. So uh, technically this was a uh, framework analysis. We used deductive coding based on the Bullock model. Um, that was our sort of primary approach, but um, in going through the transcripts, if there were additional uh, concepts and themes that uh, arose that didn't sort of neatly fit into this Bullock uh, framework, um, we were able to sort of note uh, and account for those as well. Um, and our analytic process, we had two coders per transcript. Um, we used consensus coding to ensure rigor, and each domain was analyzed separately to uh, identify themes. Um, and so just in some in terms of sort of how, what uh, our accomplishments were there, um, we were able to um, interview folks from se uh, seven of the eight states slash districts. Our interviews were done in 2023. Um, we ultimately completed nine interviews, so we did two additional interviews for completeness, where the first interviewee was not uh, fully knowledgeable about the topic, um, and the interviews lasted about an hour each. Um, and at the end of the day, um, we came home with 129 pages of transcript and 75,000 words uh, to analyze. So um, really a mountain of, of data for us to work with and a lot of lessons um, that we could learn from that. So um, at this point, I'm going to pause for a moment and see if there are any uh, questions that folks might have. Thank you, Doug. Um, our discussion today is Dr. Holly Jarman, Associate Professor of Health Management and Policy and Global Public Health at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. So let's turn to Holly first to see whether she has any comments. Audience, please put your questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Doug. And thank you everyone for inviting me here today. I really appreciate it. And some of the reasons I appreciate this research is that um, I'm a, a qualitative researcher most of the time. And I do case studies and I uh, talk to people who are trying to implement policy on the ground. Um, and so the implementation side of this is incredibly important for understanding um, what is the policy actually being put in place? Where are the challenges, um, especially given rapid changes in the market shape for tobacco products and product availability, um, as well as policy implementation? Um, with those changes, trying to understand uh, these pain points is very important. So I'm very grateful, that, Doug, that you're doing research in this way. I'm also glad that it's qualitative because um, the for anyone to give context to anyone who's not a qualitative researcher on this call, this is a very, going to be very rich data. Even with a small number of interviews completed, you uh, really are overwhelmed by the different um, things that you discover just by talking to people who um, do this for a living. Um, so I'm very grateful for that too. I had a, a point that I think you might want to consider, Doug, as you go forward, which is I think often with this kind of research, not only do we do interviews, which takes a lot of time and manpower, and as I said, is rich data, but we also often have um, legal analysis or policy analysis or reading and background information that all that research that goes into being able to ask the right questions to our, our interviewees. I think it can often be very helpful for other people who are not qualitative researchers, um, including journal reviewers, but not just limited to journal reviewers, to hear more about that side of the research. Um, and I think it's also great to be able to triangulate a bit more between those accounts of what's happening, um, the other documentary data, and then what you're finding in the interviews. Um, I think that can be one way that you demonstrate um, how, how robust the, the findings are and how much work that you did to get there. Um, so I don't know if you want to say more about that now or wait till later, but um, that's the, the kind of thing I would recommend. Um, 
And I'm not quite sure how you got all of the Bullock model into an interview protocol, but well done for trying to do that. I like that this comprehensive approach. And I would say, um, I think this research is also important because there's a disconnect between how implement si in, in, implementation science studies have dealt with these questions and how um, studies elsewhere in public policy have dealt with this. And so I think trying to bring those two things together uh, is really great. So I'm gonna hold the rest of my comments for later on because they're bigger picture stuff, but I'm looking forward to having a deeper discussion. Thanks. Fantastic, and, and thank you for those comments, Holly. Uh, they're all well taken. Um, and I think, you know, uh, just if we, among the members of our team, um, you know, we have uh, folks who have been involved actually in writing these policies uh, uh, from the get-go. Actually, Jenny Chadwick, one of uh, my co-eyes who's um, helping to moderate here, um, is, is somebody who has done a fair bit of work in that space and has been invaluable in our understanding of, of these policies, uh, both in, in terms of, you know, how we approach the, the, the uh, interview process and also how we understand the, the answers that we get. Um, and further, we have not as co-eyes, but uh, as, as um, uh, consultants and, and colleagues, um, folks who do have law degrees um, to, uh, you know, also kind of chime in and make it sure that, you know, we're uh, on track and not missing, you know, key elements of, of um, you know, the details of these policies and how they may actually, how, how the legal details may affect implementation. Um, any questions uh, from? Um, no, I haven't seen any questions in the Q&A yet. So we'll wait for later on. Um, so please continue. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is dip into uh, some of the results of uh, you know what we've heard from the interviews. Later on, I'll talk a little bit about uh, sort of our experience uh, applying the Bullock model, just to sort of give a flavor for um, you know what it takes to do this research. Um, a couple of things to note: um, one, uh, as you know, folks could gather, there's there's more. Uh, uh, data here than we can possibly share. So um, I'm really going to just be kind of sharing some illustrative examples that don't give necessarily the full picture of how um, these flavor restrictions are being implemented. Um, we also um, promised our participants that we would not identify states or individuals. And so you'll see that um, some of the state agencies, for example, we've used generic names rather than specific names um, so that we don't necessarily identify um, any of the folks uh, who, who we were speaking with. So um, one of the first things I want to do is share, this is a, a sort of a, a, an outline that reintroduces uh, the, the figures that I showed earlier on, um, adds in the policy actors to this process model here. And um, what I wanted to show is how we filled this in um, based on the results of our interviews. And I'm not gonna go through uh, all of the detail on this slide. Um, really, I just wanted to share that, you know, ha as daunting as using the full Bullock, full Bullock model was, um, it was really, really uh, helpful to us in being able to populate this entire figure um, and help us to think through all of the uh, potential moving parts in the policy implementation process. So, um, I'll, I'll, you know, folks can come back to this uh, later on um, if they're interested, but just wanted to sort of demonstrate kind of the richness of the detail that we were able to get out of uh, these interviews. So, um, I'm going to go over a few of the, the highlights of the topics that we um, heard. So one um, thing that we were hearing about was sort of deep, uh, aspects that of, of implementation that are, are or are not written into the policy itself. Um, so one key element um, that affected the implementation was authority. Um, so any um, of the actors authority to implement the policy um, may have been based on how tobacco and e-cigarette and flavor laws are situated within um, public health agencies existing authorities based on state laws. So, um, you know, what they are able to do, um, you know, what they're being asked to do and what they're able to do um, didn't, you know, were, were constrained by, uh, you know, existing law in addition to whatever was laid out in the, the uh, e-cigarette policy itself. Um, and horizontal integration was one um, piece of that, and I'll get uh, I'll 
demonstrate that. So one quote that we heard here was, um, but our inspectors, so there's no teeth for them to make themselves be let in. They also have no power to seize products. So if a store is illegal, se illegally selling, uh, they can cite them, they can find them, but they can't take that product with them. So um, yeah, the folks who are doing these inspections uh, were in this case, not able to confiscate uh, products that were um, against the law, um, even if they could identify them, they didn't have that legal power to do that. Um, and then uh, with respect to horizontal integration, um, another quote we heard was, there were conversations at the state level between the Department of Health, the Tobacco Control Program, the Attorney General's Office, and then the State Department of Revenue. I would say we were the three agencies that were trying to figure out when this law went into effect, who would actually be implementing it. And so the, the key insight there is that, you know, it wasn't necessarily written into the law exactly which agency was going to sort of be responsible and take the lead. Um, on the implementation process, um, and these three agencies, uh, in this case, work together to figure it out. Um, another uh, thing that came up was uh, the issue of licensure. So um, if uh, states or localities are requiring uh, licenses, that helps um, inspectors to determine which stores can legally sell products and where the inspectors need to go uh, to do their inspections uh, and, and figure out who's in violation. Um, and of course, it also provides a lever for enforcement. So if somebody's in violation of a policy, their license could be uh, potentially taken away. Um, so we heard, we work together, the Department of Revenue, they've just got pretty much everything up on their website, but we know how many licenses they have and keep track of any folks who are selling that don't have a Department of Revenue license and make sure that we get that information to the Department of Revenue. And we also heard we have a database system that each one of our funded programs use, and even some localities that aren't funded use to record all of their inspection data and all their underage sales data. And it's updated and they all update it with any new retailer that is licensed in their area. And every time they do an inspection, we can see the level of violations. And so this is a case where, you know, having this licensure system really helped these agencies to um, track uh, the, the enforcement activities that they needed to um, be pursuing, but this was not uh, universally the case uh, across all the states that we spoke with. Um, we also heard some about wholesale slash online and retail sales. Um, so sometimes policy language would create loopholes um, in this space. So one quote was, so wholesalers can do business in our state on flavored tobacco products and they can sell to retailers too. So retailers can have a huge stockpile and continue to buy and there's nothing illegal about that. It's when the product exchanges hands between the retailer and the customer that the law is broken. And then also, our retailers can still sell flavored vapor products out of state. So they could have a website where they're selling out of state. So the fact that they have these products, for example, maybe behind the counter or in their storeroom and they could say, well, we're not selling to them to anybody here, but we have them back there because we're shipping them out to wherever. So one of the things that we've identified as a loophole that really needs to be addressed is uh, to sort of look up the chain to the wholesaler, perhaps to prohibit distribution in addition to retail sales. And so essentially what this is pointing out is that, you know, uh, 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 having this sort of uh, confluence between the, the retailer and the wholesaler meant that a retailer could have a lot of these products on site legally. And if an inspector came by and found those products that, you know, the, the person, uh, the seller could say, well, you know, we have these on a legitimate basis, um, but at the same time, they might be selling them uh, under, the counter, under the counter to um, retail customers. Um, there was certainly a lot that we heard about defining uh, how flavored products are defined. I'm not going to go through uh, every one of these quotes uh, in, in detail, but um, some st uh, states indicated they create, created a list of products that they could then share with folks who are doing um, inspections so that they know which products were in violation or not. Um, we heard, and I'm sure others have heard similarly, that um, you know, if a, a product has a clear flavored name on it, like cherry, um, then it's banned, and it's easy to sort of apply that. Um, but uh, in this quote, we heard that they, you know, they gave the example of Star Electronics flavor, and it's not clear if that's really a characterizing flavor or whether uh, or, or what that means. So um, they found that a challenge. Um, some even suggested potentially taking products to a lab to have it analyzed, which obviously is fairly cumbersome. Um, others said that they uh, internally set a precedent with our local health officers, um, which is to say that I, I think in this instance that the local health officers were sort of, um, uh, you know, generating rules uh, amongst them, you know, their, their smaller co groups of colleagues 
um, to, to guide their work, but that there might have been some heterogeneity from uh, locality to locality in terms of how uh, the uh, lists of um, prohibited products were, were um, defined. And then uh, sort of the, the quote that um, we heard uh, that suggested the kind of a you know, potentially helpful way to define flavors is to say that it's anything other than tobacco flavor is not okay. And they found just from an implementation standpoint, that, that was the easiest definition to work with because there was um, less ambiguity and wiggle room. Um, funding was, uh, of course, an issue for lots of places. Um, we heard, I think this policy was certainly an unfunded mandate. There were no additional resources attached to the implementation of this policy. Um, another said, so there's no additional monetary resources to help with this as far as developing media campaigns, nothing of that nature. So, you know, a specific way that they would have hoped to use the money. Um, another said, and as you may expect, there are larger localities that have more means that are just forging right ahead and finding ways to actually enforce this law and others, I mean, it's been a good long time now, haven't done anything, just don't have the capacity. So uh, there's no funding written into the law or anything. And so this is a situation where there is variability in how the policy is being uh, implemented, depending on the size of the local enforcing agency um, and, and the resources that they had. Um, but then on a positive note, we heard, but once the policy was into effect, we added that extra step to their inspection log into the guidelines, but then they were also receiving additional funding to go through that, uh, which was really helpful. So I do feel like the resources were there. So, I mean, you know, this is just two sides of the same coin, but um, clearly indication that funding is important for the implementation process. Um, we heard some variations and challenges in terms of uh, how fines are defined and adjudicated. Um, so one quote we heard was, and it wasn't clear if the X dollar fine was on, you walk into a store and there's multiple flavor products. Is it every flavor product is X dollar fine? Or it's like, we went in one time, we see that you violated the law in this instance. So that's one fine, not clear. Um, another interviewee said, so by the time a person goes to administrative hearing, they very likely could have racked up three or more fines and then the administrative judge could say, yeah, I'm going to knock this down to one fine. So in that case, the, you know, the, there may even be a written um, uh, policy in terms of what the penalty should be, but there's some um, uh, judgment that the administrative judge has um, and that that can, um, in some cases, uh, water down the, the teeth of the, the, um, the, the law. And then we heard um, a more extreme case, but by and large, our local jurisdictions will not take any action in the tobacco space and now broadly construed as including vapes because they don't want to get sued. They don't have time and energy for that. So, um, you know, just the, the threat of having to, you know, the fight uh, uh, to get the law implemented um, was something that, you know, uh, some, this particular respondent was saying that they, they didn't even want to um, come close to. Um, additional things that we were hearing, so, you know, about how agencies and other organizations work together. So one of the main ways that we uh, heard um, that the state health agencies and the local health agencies who are principally the ones on the front lines of enforcement, although not exclusively, um, the way that that uh, uh, relationship played out was that the state agencies were providing some guidance for uh, the local uh, agencies doing the enforcement. Um, and so we heard, I really do think that having these work group calls where everyone's on board has been extremely beneficial. And I think that's probably been the best thing that's come out of it. And the collaboration that we're seeing from the local level and the state level with what we have to work with. So that was a, a very positive uh, story about um, this collaboration. Another one that we heard though was um, my role, the other aspect is just sometimes we get questions on statutes pertaining to tobacco from the general public and from local health departments, and I'm not allowed to interpret the statutes. I'm, just allowed to direct them to where they are and basically go over the principles as stated in the statutes. And so here the state health agency is basically saying, you know, I, I, I can't tell you what to do. You know, this here's here's you know where the law is written down. You can you know interpret that for yourself. Um, Interorganizational relationships were important. So health departments um, would work with retailers and community members to communicate and educate about the policy. Um, so I think one of the main strengths of implementation is the overall education of the community and the retailers. It's education, it's individual connecting and contact with retailers. So that um, relationship was very important. Um, and we heard, we 
uh, well, we have grantees that work with prevention. And this is one of the areas where they go out into the general communities, coalitions, et cetera, to make retailers aware that the law has changed. And they have a website and they alert retailers to the changes in the laws. So these are actually folks who are outside of government agencies, but who are kind of helping the government agencies by communicating with retailers. Um, of course, industry plays a role in the implementation process. Um, and uh, some of the things that we heard were attempts, uh, 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 reports that industry was attempting to influence or water down um, policies or implementation. So one example was uh, one of our respondents indicated that the resellers are telling uh, the vendors, oh, this is fine, you can sell this. Don't listen to the enforcement agency. They don't know what they're talking about. So obviously this is sort of, you know, secondhand through uh, our interviewees, but definitely, um, you know, something that would raise some concern. Um, lastly, you know, we heard some other things about additional determinants or barriers and facilitators. Um, so timing and sequencing clearly uh, is an issue. Several of the states had um, experience restricting the sales of flavored products um, during the 2019 Avali crisis. And so, you know, we're able to sort of hit the ground running and had some experience uh, in this space already. Um, in some instances, the policies were implemented very rapidly, leaving the agencies and retailers little time to organize compliance. So um, they might not be able to sort of figure out what they needed to do or, you know, sell off existing products, for example. Um, and then for some states, that there, there were policies that were enacted at the same time as flavor restrictions, and then they had sort of competing priorities that they had to manage as well. And, and lastly, uh, you know, one uh, cannot give uh, uh, a post-2020 uh, presentation without mentioning COVID. Of course, COVID um, messed up uh, the implementation of these cigarette policies in addition to everything else in our lives. Um, so in terms of the responses of folks who were affected by the policy, we heard from our respondents that um, there was generally public support for flavor restrictions. That was a high level of support. Um, some retailers were trying to evade the policy through under-the-counter sales and, and similar uh, processes. Um, the industry, as I mentioned earlier, were introducing products that were not clearly uh, affected by the flavor restriction. Um, so I'm actually going to pause there for our, our second pause, see if there are any uh, additional um, comments or questions at this point before I get into um, describing some of our experiences applying the Bullock model. Sure. So um, I'm going to come back in again, if that's OK, Dirk. Um, and thank you for presenting these results. I think um, it's very important for the folks on this call and for everybody to understand these are quite, um, I think, representative of some of the findings that um, I see emerging in this field. I think this is very important stuff that um, we need to have a bit more awareness around. And what I was wondering is trying to noodle on this and think um, there are really important questions here around issues that you've uncovered like licensure. So with flavors, for example, one of the issues is if you shift the policy window to, to saying these flavored products are now illegal products, you're actually maybe taking retailers or retail activity outside of that controlled space. So you're saying that, and, and I think that's an absolutely accurate finding that licensure is really important for being able to, as a lever of power, for being able to um, do something to implement the policies we have. But once we take a sales activity outside of that legal box um, and that it goes into illegal enforcement, there are other questions. And I think maybe our implementation systems are not quite fit for purpose at the moment in dealing with these distinctions between enforcement activities in legal spaces and enforcement activities, um, retail that's taking place that is closer to illegal activity. Um, and that's just something that's come up in my own research and I'd love your take on that. I also think that um, it might, you might like to know that this stuff about covering the supply chain is coming up in our international cases. So this is not just limited to US jurisdictions. And I think again, you're spot on. Um, policies are not really, the, the policy language is not designed to think about the whole supply chain. And especially, I think there are really important blind spots around distribution networks. And we're seeing those in, come forward in sharp relief now with a lot of online sales, social media sales, um, and our, our language and practices in policy implementation and not keeping up with that. I was trying to think about a couple of suggestions for bringing these themes together in ways that can move you towards your goal of informing modeling. And I wanted to suggest a couple of qualitative methods tricks. Um, I'm wondering whether there are ways to cluster or chunk this data 
um, we sometimes use the word chunk, the, the word chunking to talk about categorizing or bringing together the findings um, in ways that then improve the bullet model. Because I think while it's a really great model, and I know you'll be talking about this for um, formulating research questions and protocols and, and making sure you are comprehensive in your project. At the same time, we maybe need something that's a companionate model that informs um, people who are doing this in policy practice. And that might need to be clearer, more parsimonious. And I think the closer we can get to something clearer and more parsimonious, the more useful that will be for modelers who might be thinking that, that, about this in a slightly different way in terms of, um, do I need to add to my assumptions something around a delay of the implementation effect? So how can I do that in a standardized way that's a reasonable assumption? Or how can I condition it maybe on the capacity of each jurisdiction that I'm covering? So um, I think there might be ways to use qualitative methods, techniques like chunking or grounded theory or to, to reduce the data, the complexity of the data in your findings a bit more, and then maybe build those into some logic models for evaluation that are a little bit simpler and can move us towards um, less, exactly the title of your talk, so less of a binary toggle on is the policy in place or not. Uh, and I'll stop there, but I, I have more I could talk about this all day, but I'll wait for others. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and. and great questions and, and insights as well. Um, with respect to licensure, I, I, I think, I, you know, I, I think there's probably just a lot that I and our team don't necessarily know about sort of the ins and outs of, you know, how that's going to play out for um, sort of things that are operating outside of that licensure structure versus within the licensure structure. But I suppose, in, you know, in some ways, I think, you know, the way I have thought about is that, you know, licensure is sort of an effect modifier, if you want to put it in, um, you know, sort of quantitative modeling terms where um, having that additional lever in place gives folks who are uh, in the enforcement process, um, you know, a, a something that they can use uh, to um, penalize folks if need be. Um, and and um, so, you know, I, I, my, our sense has been that it is an, a useful adjunct um, to that process, but I'm sure that there's, there's more uh, to it and you may have additional things in mind as well. Um, with respect to chunking, uh, you know, I think it's, it's absolutely right. Uh, you know, one of the things we'll talk about in a minute is um, sort of the density of uh, information that we get out of this. Um, and, and I think, you know, as we have been synthesizing these data, um, I think that is, that's sort of been the stage at which, you know, we've taken you know, this very uh, dense and granular um, data and tried to draw bigger picture lessons from it. And, and that, uh, you know, we're, we're not, you know, trying to sort of pin things down to specific concepts and domains necessarily in Bullock, but what the Bullock model has allowed us to do is to make sure that we've asked the, you know, uh, as a broad range of questions um, so that when there are specific aspects of the implementation process that are varying uh, as opposed to things that are not varying or um, that may that we can sort of conceptually um, understand to have some impact on ultimate outcomes that you know that having asked all of the questions allows us to then see which ones are popping if you will um, and and uh, are, are worth uh, further pursuit but I it sounds like you are suggesting there are additional um, sort of, you know, specifically rigorous methods for chunking, um, and those would be uh, definitely worthwhile for us to, to consider going forward. Are there any additional questions before? Yes, uh, there's one from Catherine Zaya. Um, are you finding any characteristics of the leaders or processes where the outcomes have been the most successful? Um, this is an important question, and uh, when we get to our limitation slide, you'll see, you know, we're, we're in the early state. Right now, we're sort of characterizing the implementation process, and to the extent that we have information on the outcomes of the implementation process, it's sort of um, the self-reports of uh, the folks who we're interviewing, and we haven't, you know, we, we have, we're at the sort of the beginning phases of applying this to the more quantitative research questions, you know, where we can see what the impact of different implementation strategies are. But of course, in in this specific space where we're, you know, we're dealing with seven um, states and a limited, you know, 
uh, sample size, you know, there, there are some limits to um, how far, you know, we can take that in a quantitative um, uh, realm. Yeah. There is also a question from Tanya Wells. Have you seen any specific examples where the retailer and the wholesaler are the same entity and the issues uh, that it can pose? Um, you know, I, I think I can only point to the quotes that we heard from our interviewees where, you know, they were, you know, finding specific examples of that, or, uh, you know, where the inspectors were sort of um, uh, coming up against that. Um, I, but I, you know, this is just sort of the reports that we've received from our interviewees, um, and it's not something that we've, you know, sort of specifically drilled down further uh, on, um, you know, with, with additional folks in the you know, implementation process. Thank you. Those are all the questions that I see. So please go ahead and uh, look forward to seeing more results. Thank you. Okay, great. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is really just kind of our experience using um, the Bullock model, and then I'll try to get through that quickly so we have a few more minutes for a uh, more general discussion. Um, so uh, the coding process, uh, there's a steep learning curve to this. So as, you, know, you could see that there's a lot involved in uh, the Bullock model. Not all the concepts are in the framework are well-defined. Sometimes you kind of have to do a lot of back and forth with the source material uh, to really understand what it is um, uh, any particular aspect is getting at. Um, and the fact that the scope of this um, uh, framework is so broad means that it's, it's just a cognitive challenge to sort of keep everything in mind as one is doing um, the coding. Um, that being said, the framework is quite comprehensive and we didn't really identify a whole lot of codes um, that we needed to generate sort of inductively. And so, you know, it was a, very useful to us in that, it, you know, it really did kind of cover a lot of the things that we uh, uh, were hearing. Um, in terms of its applicability to tobacco policy and, and to policy research, policy implementation science, um, having something which is sort of tailor built for policy implementation was definitely an advantage, we thought. Um, if there are other implementation scientists uh, 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 on, on the Zoom, um, you know, if you're familiar with something like CIFR, um, another implementation uh, framework, um, you know, one could potentially do this work with a more generic uh, framework, but it just would require, I think, broader thinking and this being tailor-made, I think, allowed us to get to relevant issues um, more quickly and directly. Um, there were some concepts and domains that were underdeveloped in the framework, um, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, those I think are things that will iterate and improve over time. Um, this is an example of the coding density that we got out of this, if there are qualitative researchers on the call, so this is that of uh, NVivo. Um, so, you know, we were finding that single data elements would reveal information relevant to multiple aspects of policy implementation. Um, we also found that there are elements that are sort of conceptually distinct, for example, policy authority and actors that were consistently overlapping. And so if you want to think about the, the figure on the right hand side, if we have a transcript text on the left hand side, you know, you might have one sentence and every uh, uh, bit of color that's directly to the right of that sentence is a code that would apply to that sentence. And so you can see just, you know, any one sort of comment that we got from an interview, we really kind of raised a, a whole host of issues. Um, but, you know, the, the fact that there was this overlap, I think, does mean that, you know, if somebody wanted to have a, do a more parsimonious application of this model, I think they could. Um, we found it beneficial to do the whole thing, even as cumbersome as it was, um, to just to really know that we were not missing anything and that um, we were getting a full picture of, of the process. Um, in terms of our interviewees, you know, we were talking to health department employees generally. Uh, they were generally willing to speak. Um, but as government employees, some were constrained by communication policies, and despite our assurances, some were hesitant to share flaws about their state's implementation. Um, and you could get two different perspectives from two different people, um, as you could on virtually anything. Um, so general limitations for the work, uh, uh, you know, this is a single policy context. So, you know, we're applying Bullock to e-cigarette uh, regulation. It might work slightly differently in other settings. Um, we only did one to two interviews per state. Um, so there's certainly a lot more folks in that, you know, a lot of actors that we identified that we didn't speak with and, you know, uh, you know, if we had 10 more years to do the work, um, you know, those would be really, really helpful. Um, we didn't talk to federal uh, employees of, uh, uh, either. Um, we did local interviews, but we didn't, we haven't yet incorporated those into um, the, this, uh, you know, discussion. Um, as with all qualitative findings, these represent the breadth of experience, but not necessarily how common experiences are. 
Um, this represents the first few years of implementation, um, and we don't yet know the relationship, uh, you know, as we've discussed, between the implementation details and um, e-cigarette use, or more specifically, flavored e-cigarette use. So that's the sort of final uh, scientific slide. I do want to just, uh, you know, acknowledge my team here. Um, this was very much a team effort. You can see a, a long list of names here, folks who are doing interviews, coding, analysis, uh, co-investigators, co-thinkers, um, partners in crime, and uh, none of this could have done been done without this full uh, team of people. So I want to thank all of them um, and thank all of you for your attention. And, um, you know, I look forward to uh, additional questions and discussion. Thank you. Uh, let's turn it to Holly first to see whether she has any comments. Sure. I mean, I'll keep it short and sweet because we've got a few more minutes left. Um, but I think that uh, I'm I, I really want to be able to see the results once you have a bit more and you can integrate with the different levels. Because I do think that one of the great advantages of doing this kind of work is um, a quantitative or configurational approach would split this data into different distinct variables. And what you're able to see and why this could be very powerful is the combinations of factors that are causing the poor implementation outcomes that you see in some cases. So um, to, to sort of speak to our quant folks in the audience, I would love to see uh, maybe some, I, I don't know, agent-based models or, or something based on a stakeholder analysis that takes the insights from this and is showing what are the relationships between these different actors that are engaging here um, that you've you've covered by, through these interviews and thinking about um, the, the use, of, use of Bullock's framework and how to refine it. Um, I would love to see those relationships writ large. I think that might be the kind of thing also that might be practical and helpful for people considering this policy in the future. Who do you have to think about? Who should you be forming relationships with? particularly as I think your interviews are showing already that um, coordination is a massive factor here. Um, and I would say that's both coordination across actors within one case, one place, but also the ways that different places talk to each other. And especially at the local level, that's, as we know in public health, that's incredibly important, right? You know, might have relationships between cities, counties, and other jurisdictions trying to address this problem. And the market is not limited to one case. So I'm hope, I'd love to hear a bit more about what you're planning to do in the future to integrate this with the other levels. Um, and otherwise, I think um, it's great to show the comprehensiveness and usefulness of the Bullock framework. And I'd love to also then get some tools which can be used for the people that we're interviewing, because um, I do feel like we should serve them with this research as well, that um, can be helpful, to, especially to new jurisdictions who are worried about how on earth do I go about doing this? Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, you know, as I mentioned, you know, and this basically is, this reflects just sort of, you know, where we were at when we wrote the proposal, as is often the case, um, you know, the, the, the local uh, work is, is very local to us. Um, and, and so, and uh, obviously Massachusetts um, is, is uh, an N of one in, in a lot of ways. Um, so, uh, you know, we will keep that in mind as, as we proceed with that work. You know, one of the things that we've been contemplating, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, method is um, qualitative comparative analysis and, and um, essentially uh, for other folks what that, you know, allows one to do is to take uh, essentially more binary data, uh, uh, but, um, you know, looking at a variety of potential factors that affect uh, implementation um, and identifying characteristics of policy implementation or of policy details or, or of anything uh, uh, and figuring out sort of what are necessary and sufficient um, characteristics of a policy implementation process um, to, to affect outcomes. And so that's one of the ways that we're contemplating translating some of this, some of the insights here into um, more general insights that we can bring back to state health agencies that are, are considering this uh, work going forward. You know, of course, uh, you know, the context from state to state vary quite a lot in terms of, you know, as you are, are indicating, you know, the relationships between uh, state departments of health and local departments of health, you know, 
is is there you know uh, preemption? Uh, are there you know preemption laws in place that affect um, what local uh, uh, agencies can do and how you know their how that affects kind of uh, within state variability in implementation? That's that's certainly a, a characteristic. And there are loads of other. Um, uh, ways that states differ in terms of how they approach this. Um, and, you know, what we're looking at here is the early adopter states, essentially. Um, and there are, you know, going to, the, the way that this plays out will probably be somewhat different um, uh, in some other locations, which isn't to say that the insights we get here won't be helpful, but, um, you know, those specific contexts will always certainly be important. Oh, and um, I just will say not to use up all the time, but um, I'm so glad you're considering QCA for qualitative comparative analysis. It's it's my thing. So if you have a <laughs> conversation about that, um, I would totally be up for that. Um, but I love that the you're, you're considering it in this way. I think that's actually going to be very powerful if you're doing a case cross case comparison uh, yeah. in a systematic way. Great. Thank Other you. Questions? Yes. Uh, so I think most of the questions are being answered, but there is one I think uh, may get your opinion about. So it's from Jonathan Falls, uh, um, and he asks, do you believe there will ever be effective enforcement of tobacco product regulation uh, that makes sure that only authorized products are available? Uh, <laughs> ever. Um... I, you know, I, I think it, 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 ever is a long time and, um, you know, successful is a spectrum. So, um, I, you know, probably depends on sort of where we set the bar. Um, you know, obviously there's, there's been success with things like minimum legal sales age uh, restrictions. Um, you know, as folks know, there are, uh, you know, there's the Sinar law, there's, you know, uh, uh, FDA sponsored in inspections as well. Um, there are public, you know, publicly reported results of those inspections. So, you know, there are some successful examples, uh, you know, and again, successful maybe uh, in some respects in the eye of the beholder. But, um, you know, I think that is an example where, um, you know, uh, uh, a policy action is being taken. And I think it does, you know, affect sort of circumstances on the ground. Um, and, you know, we've laid out some of the challenges here for, um, implementing flavor restrictions, but, you know, I don't necessarily, I don't think in the space between sort of where the state law is written and, and you know, where the uh, recipients are uh, in, in our framework that it is impossible to have some uh, successful implementation. I think, you know, some of the challenges are in some senses upstream in terms of what products are getting into the country and, you know, all those, you know, I think Holly mentioned these, you know, supply chain issues, you know, those I think are, are very challenging uh, at the moment and have been vexing um, for FDA and others. Um, so, you know, I think that this is not easy, um, but I do think that there are, you know, opportunities to, uh, you know, make advances here. Uh, thank you. I think we're about time. I'll turn it over to uh, Lei to take us out. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so um, we are out of time. However, if you still have burning questions or thoughts for Dr. Levy, you can join us for Top of the Tops, an interactive group discussion offered immediately following select Tops events this season. And to join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL, post it in the chat, and switch rooms with us once this event concludes. And we'll leave this webinar room open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL. So the URL is bit.ly dash tops meeting. And if you are interested in presenting for us next season, and please consider submitting a brief presentation proposal on our website, tobaccopolicy.org by October 7th. And thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. And finally, thank you to the audience of 187 people for your participation. And have a tops notch weekend. <laughs>